one sec so I don't do that again. Um, can you tell me why B and D are geometric series? Mm. Everywhere you see an N, the N is appearing as an exponent. So sometimes you might see an N appearing as an exponent and N not as an exponent, but in order for it to be a true geometric series, everywhere you see an N in your series, it must appear up in the exponent for it to be geometric in nature because a geometric series, in words, what, is, what, what, what defines a geometric series? Each term gets multiplied by a common ratio, and that's where we're getting this exponential factor going on. Alrighty, so we got B and D being geometric series. Did you guys list out any terms and find A and R to see which ones converge and diverge? Because in order to see if a geometric series converges, right, we have to look at the R value and we say if R is less than 1, our series converges. If R absolute value is greater than 1 or equal to 1, that series diverges. So did anybody else get B and D and find R for me for each of those? I think that B oh, why did you think B diverged? Can you help me out here? What did you get for that one, Taylor? What did you do? What was your thinking? Um, my A was negative 650. Okay. And my R was negative Ah, beautiful. I agree with you. I like it. B definitely diverges. B diverges because if you find your A value, it's negative 6 fifths. The R value is negative 6 fifths. And the absolute value of that is greater than 1. And therefore, it diverges. Did you list out your terms? Is that how you found A? So, so if we did list out our term, we would start with n being 1, and that would give you 6 over negative 5. n being 2 would be... Uh, negative 6 over 5, but you'd multiply by negative 6 over 5, correct, dot, dot, dot. So A, your first term, R, that value that you're multiplying by each time to get the consecutive other terms. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Everybody good with B? All right, D, is that convergent? What's my A and what's my R? Somebody else. Who wants to Griffin? Help me out here. My A was 16. A is 16 for you? R is three-fourths, almost, yeah, maybe negative three-fourths. Yeah, I thought so. I thought you had that. I, I knew you had that. Absolute. So R is negative three-fourths. If we listed out our term, when N is zero for my first term, that's going to give me four squared or 16. The second term, I'm going to have 16, but then when N is one, I think that's going to give me, okay, well, slow down, Tina. You're going way too fast and doing things in your head. I don't want to do that. If I rewrote what is inside my series, I would have negative 3 to the N times 4 to the 2 over 4 to the N. I like to look at it that way because that helps me view my factors that have N involved. And so my first term is 16 when n is 0. When n is 1, my second term is 16 times negative 3 fourths. My third term is 16 times negative 3 fourths squared, etc., etc., etc. So you are right, Griffin. R is negative 3 fourths. The absolute value of negative 3 fourths is less than 1. And therefore, that means this series converges and did you get a sum? Uh, 16 over 1 plus 3 I didn't take it anymore. No worries, that's okay. I'll go a little farther for us, but that's good because we know that if our sums converges, the sum of any geometric series is A over 1 minus R provided that series converges R being negative 3 fourths gives us this. If we wanted to get a common denominator on the bottom, did anybody go farther and get me like a simplified fraction? Anybody? Yeah, Kyle, what'd you get? You got 64 over 7. 14 times 4, 64 over 4 plus 3 is 7. Beautiful, that's what I get too. Very nice. Any questions on our warm-up?
Any questions on our warm up? Yeah. No. I'm going for the R and for B because mm -hmm. it's just like, like I know realistically it's six mm -hmm. over five, but it's just like when I list out the terms and I see 13 over 25, I don't see how we got Ah, oh, good question. So, what I like to do when I list out my terms on B, so you're right. Okay, so let me, let me look at what's inside this series a little bit. I like to put things together with N's. So I would, like you said, s put 2 times 3 together as N. And then on the bottom, I would have negative 5 to the N. And that there tells me right away. So do you see how you put the 6 to the N and then negative 5 to the N? So my first term is when N is 1. So that's going to give me 6 over negative 5. My second term is when n is 2. So you would get 36 over 25. But I actually don't ever do that. What I do is I say to myself, okay, I started with 6 times negative 5, and what did I need to do? What do I do when I'm at my second term? Because I know this is my a value, so I know it's going to repeat. Well, when n is 2, I'm just going to take that and multiply it times another one. I do that in my head, which isn't good because that's how I find my R. But the other way would be just like you said, let's say you don't see that right away. And let's say you just go 36 over 25. I was adding them. Oh, you were adding them, not multiplying them. So then you would see, you would just ask yourself what the question is. What would I multiply by to get the next number you were adding? Good, I'm just glad you answered your own question. I love it when you guys can see your own mistakes. That's good. Okay, guys, I do have a question for you. C, it is not geometric. This guy is not geometric. But what kind of series is this, just out of curiosity? It's a P series. Thanks, Jenna. Very nice. How do you know it's a P series? Because N is down here in the basement, down here in the denominator. It's like a polynomial. And what does that P series actually do? Does it converge or diverge? The p-value is 3, that's greater than 1, and therefore it converges, absolutely. So that p-series actually converges. Can I find a sum for that series, even though it converges? I mean, if it converges, nope. Why not, Megan, because it's not easy. easy. Correct, it's not easy. I like that, that was such a good answer. It's not easy. It's not a calculus 2 thing that we really do. No, we're not going to do that. The only sums that you will be asked to find are sums of geometric series and telescoping series. I love it. I love it. Okay, one more question. Here we go. Before we leave this page, here we go. A. A is not geometric. What kind is that? What do we call that? Griffin? It is an alternating P series. It's an alternating series because it's got the negative 1 to the N. It's a P series because if I rewrote that series, it would be N to what power? Somebody different. Help me out here. N to the what? Anna. One half. And what does an alternating P series do? Converge or diverge? It conditionally converges. Absolutely. This alternating series conditionally converges. Why? Can you explain to me, Anna, why it conditionally converges? What test tells me that it conditionally converges? The alternating series the alternating. converges, but if you take the series, it diverges. Very nice. Very nice. The alternating series test which is when we take the limit as n goes to infinity and we look at our terms without the negative 1 on it, that tells me that my limit is 0. Not only that my terms are decreasing, but we said we're just going to focus on this being true. If this is true and my series alternates, then it converges. Now, how do we know if it conditionally converges versus absolutely converges? That has to do with what the positive series does. And if I look at my positive term series, that's again a P series, that P series diverges. And therefore, that says this one converges conditionally. This series converges conditionally. It converges by the alternating series test, but it converges on the condition that it's alternating. 
If it wasn't alternating, that positive term series would diverge. So we say that this guy right here converges conditionally. It, because we're putting those negatives in there, those terms get to zero fast enough. Remember, we had that idea of your terms have to be going to zero, but they have to go to zero fast enough. Positive terms, even though they're heading to zero, they don't go fast enough. That power right there it helps us determine that if it's positive. Okay, series. Jacob told me that they're all power series because they have the X in them. That's how we know they're power series, right? Infinite polynomials going on here. Are any of these geometric in form by any chance? Megan? The first, one. the first one is because N appears in the exponent only. How about the second one? Is that geometric? Nope, because it's got a 2N in the bottom. How about this guy? Is this geometric? Nope, because it has an N in the bottom. Good. So the only one that's geometric in form is the first one. So what are we going to do to determine the interval of convergence for power series? What test are we going to use? The ratio test. Thank you. If it's geometric, you can use the R value. If it's not geometric, you have to use the ratio test. Either way, any way, you can always use the ratio test. So I'm just going to put a little note here. We are using ratio test, actually on two out of three of those, but you could use it on all of them. But the ratio test helps us find the interval of convergence. So I'm going to give you guys five minutes to find the interval of convergence for each of those series. Actually, I'll give you six. That's two minutes per series. I want the interval of convergence for each one. Let me set that limit up for you and make sure you're at least on the right track. Oh.
take another minute. I'm going to go ahead and put some answers up here so you can compare with me. All righty, that first one is geometric. So keep working, keep working, and then you can compare with what I have up here. That first one is geometric. The A value is 1, and the R value is X. And therefore, the absolute value of R is the absolute value of X has to be less than 1 to converge. So that tells us negative 1 is less than X is less than 1. That second one, Okay, guys, just a quick reminder, all righty? As you're working through these, most of you guys are done. I've been watching them walking around, so I see that most of you are done. That first one is geometric. That's really nice. If you can decipher it as being geometric, and if you can think this through on a test or any situation, if you can recognize that's geometric, just pulling off the R value is enough to suffice to get your interval of convergence. Okay, but it has to be geometric for that to work, okay? Not only that, but if it's geometric, not only can you do that quick way to find the interval of convergence, but you can also right away find your sum. Your sum is A over 1 minus R. So that is really cool. If you recognize a power series as being a geometric power series, that is super powerful for us. Okay, because not only do we get an interval of convergence really fast, but more importantly, we actually can get the sum for that series. Second one, you applied the ratio test and you found that the limit is zero, which is always less than one, which means it converges on the entire number line. Why is Ah, because x is a variable. Well, for this problem, x is a variable, but it's a constant. We're holding it as a constant because the only thing that's getting affected is n. As the bottom grows infinitely big, we have a constant divided by something infinitely big. Right? That's like having 10 over something really big, or 1 over something really big. x is just a constant right now. And so this thing grows infinitely big. Anything divided by something infinitely big is always going to 0. That is always less than 1. And our ratio test over here, I put it up here. Our ratio test says that if you're less than 1, then you are in the convergent category. So you have to be less than 1 to converge. This, I will point this out while I have it if you guys see the board. On the left side, do you see that? Can somebody tell me, on the last one, did you guys get an interval of convergence from negative 1 to 1? Now, there is a problem. The problem is, when you're applying 
doing the ratio test, if you have an equals 1 in your limit, in other words, when x equals 1 or x is negative 1, the test is inconclusive. So if you're applying your ratio test, you have to check your endpoints, okay? You have to check your endpoints to figure out if, if your interval of convergence is complete. And, Nate, how do we do that? Because I saw you got it right. What did you do with those numbers? You plugged them up into the original. So you took n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n minus 1 times negative 1 to the n, because you plug negative 1 in for x. And what did that, oh, hang on, Tina. Let me think that through a second. Negative 1 to the n times negative 1 to the n is giving me 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 to the n times negative 1 to the negative 1 over n. Oh, I'm getting n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 over n. Should, should it be negative 1 to the n over the Let's see. So let me check. If I put x to be negative 1, okay, now, negative 1 to the n, negative 1 to the n is negative 1 times negative 1 to the n, and then I have negative 1 to the negative 1. So those cancel. 1 to the n is just 1. And this is left over. So I have a negative 1 over an n. Now, any number, negative 1 is just a number. It's not alternating. Do you see that this sucker doesn't change based on n? It doesn't alternate. So this is simply a G, uh, uh, excuse me, a P series where all the terms in it, actually it's the harmonic series, where all the terms in it are multiplied by negative one. I'm just gonna pull that outside my series. I can pull it out because it doesn't have an N on it. It's just a constant, okay? So what does this P series do? It diverges. So that means we are open right here. Okay, so that P series diverges. Let me write that down. This is the harmonic series. It's also a P series. And it diverges. And therefore, I know this has to stay open. Then we go and we check the other side when X is 1. So putting it back up into our original equation, oh no, slow down, Tina. Instead of x, you're putting a 1 in here. And I'm going to multiply things out again. So I have a negative 1 times a 1 to the n. I have a negative 1 to the negative 1 over n. Huh. So what's happening now? So I ha again, I have this negative 1 that I could pull out if I want to. But what I'm left with inside, this time notice, is a negative 1 to the n, right? Now, this sucker is alternating. Let me make it big. Let me make it bigger. Guys, see this right here. Let me show you right here, right? This one here has the n on it. When you take this and this and multiply them, it gives you negative 1 to the n. That's alternating. It's an alternating p-series, which Anna reminded us last time, this converges conditionally. It converges conditionally by the alternating series test. And since it converges conditionally, that means when you go to write your interval, you have to include 1. And so the interval of convergence is negative 1 to 1. Huh. Okay, questions? Following power series. The sum n equals 0 to infinity of 4 over 5 to the n times x to the n. Why is it a power series? How do we know it's a power series? Because where's n? n is up in the where? 
three. Where's the end? It's up in the what? Where's our ends? Up in the, they're in all terms in the what? What do we? What is that? The exponent, the power, right? They're up there in the exponent and the power. That makes it a geometric series. I know, I just called on people randomly. All right, so guys, if it's a geometric series, it converges. I want the interval of convergence, give me the interval of convergence, and I want the sum. I want the interval of convergence, and I want the sum. Interval of convergence, and I want the sum. I know what it was. You just didn't know exactly. You know what's going on. I know you did. Everyone knows. So I'm going to ask you for the sum, guys, right here. Okay, I want the interval of convergence and the sum. My quiet tables. Okay, guys. So I want the interval of convergence and the sum. Hold on. Don't worry. I'm going to get you for something, too. Okay. What's your A value? so far? Uh-huh. And my sum? And my sum? So I know it's a geometric series because n is appearing only in the exponent. So that gives me a clue, geometric series. If I list out my terms, my first term is when n is 0. When n is 0, my first term is 4. My next term, when n is 1, is going to be 4 times x over 5. The next term is going to be 4 times x over 5 squared, etc. So... A is 4, R is x over 5. Lilia, did you get me my interval of convergence? Yep, absolutely. You Did you do this? Did you set absolute value of x over 5 less than 1? Because that's our R value. That's We want that to be less than 1 for it to converge, which means we have the absolute value of x over 5 less than 1 creates negative 1 less than x over 5 less than 1, that three-part inequality. We multiply each side by 5, and as Lilia said, it's negative 5 to 5. We don't need to test our endpoints, right? Because r has to be strictly less than 1 for that geometric series to converge. So we're good. All righty, Holden, help me out here. What's my sum? My sum is a over 1 minus r. What'd you get? Beautiful. 4 over 1 minus x over 5. Did anybody put it together and get me a nice, nice proper fraction out of that one? Not a complex fraction. This is called a complex fraction because we've got a fraction in a fraction. Anybody simplify that up and want to give me the fraction? Four over five minus x over five? Huh, I think, let me see, let me see. So if I put those together, did you do that, Taylor? Five over five, and then four over five minus x over five? And then we flip and multiply, what'd you get? Alyssa, what'd you get, did you get? Yes, you did. 20 over 5 minus x. Very nice. Awesome blossom. Okay, guys. Any questions?